Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about defensive driving, the fundamentals of defensive driving. And I've been talking about this for the last few weeks, and we're going to build on this a little bit today and help you out to remain crash free and keep your insurance premiums low. Stick around, we'll be right back with that information. Hi there Smart Drivers, welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about Defensive Driving 101. This is especially for new drivers who recently have been successful in getting their license and are beginning to drive because this is the first couple of years of driving on your own are the dangerous times of driving. I've talked about this before of not having enough experience in the driving environment, learning about hazards on the roadway and keeping yourself safe. So we're going to talk about how to do that. We're going to look at some of the older systems the Smith Space Cushion System, SIPD, which is uh, C, uh, interpret, decide, predict, execute. You know, it's fairly complicated and quite a mouthful. So a uh, number of people are here. Rich is here from Maine. And Travel and Gaming is Colin. He's here tuning in from Calgary. And Bricks for Wheels is the moderator. That's Corey. And the Mad Trucker is here as well. Varun, I'm doing great. Thank you very much for asking. So a few people here already, and if you are just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from in the world and what class of license you're going for and what we can help you with. Uh, if you're new to Smart Drive Test, consider subscribing as well. Hit that thumbs up button. Uh, Smart Drive Test helps new drivers get a license, veteran drivers to remain crash free, and CDL drivers to start a career as a truck or bus driver. So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, just getting down to the presentation here. And uh, one of the other things I want to talk about, uh, if you're new to Smart Drive Test uh, and you're looking at the live streams, most of the live streams are going to be about an hour. Uh, and I think, <laughs> Colin, is, is everybody seeing me okay? Because my console has gone black, so I don't know whether it's going or not. Uh, Pilot's license. Colin, no, I can't help you with your pilot's license. <laughs> can't help you with that. So uh, just let me know if you can see me or not because, as I said, everything's gone black here on my console. Actually, uh, yeah, so we'll just leave it at that. We'll head over to the, uh, I'll just make sure that uh, Julie, good going for road test on 15th of this Friday. I'm from Johnson City, New York. Excellent. Awesome. Messi, thank you, you're welcome. Okay, so everything seems to be working then. Uh, like I said, it's black on my end, but whatever. It's the new beta version of YouTube, which is taking a bit uh, to get used to here. <laughs> there we go, okay, so both Colin and Corey said that it's working well, so. All right, so I'm gonna ignore what's going on back here. All right, so over to the PowerPoint presentation. There we go. Okay, Defensive Driving 101. Uh, my name is Rick August. I do have a PhD in legal history, which is study of policing, courts, and prisons, if you're not familiar with that. I was a truck driver through most of the 1990s, and uh, yesterday I was going through some old boxes and found some old logbooks, and actually I'm gonna put them up and let you have a look at those. It's kind of fun to see what I was doing almost 20 years ago now, which is interesting. Uh, 2000 to 2006, while I was going to university in Australia, I was a coach, captain, bus driver for Greyhound and one of the regional bus lines there. I became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1998 which, with an expertise in CDL training, which is uh, an American term. It tends to be commercial driver's license uh, for people who are going for truck and bus driver. And most of the time when you're getting a bus or truck license, uh, you also have to get your air brakes. And in 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne in Australia uh, with my doctorate in legal history. Uh, so I looked at law and policing as it relates to traffic, and that's what my dissertation is about. All right, so defensive driving is related directly to getting a driver's license, oddly enough. These are the four components you have to master, not only for getting a driver's license, but also for remaining crash free and the more I talk about this the more I talk about driving the more I teach this I am fundamentally convinced that space management is the key to driving safely on the roadway if you can manage space around your vehicle especially in front of your vehicle you are less much less likely to get into trouble of course all of these other pieces play into it as well and 
Harold Smith, who developed the Smith-based Christian system in the 1940s, believed that observation was key. I do believe that observation is, is important, but I don't believe it's as important as space management. So I believe that space management should be at the top of that list. So those are the four components of both passing a road test and being a defensive driver. All right, so who's driving? Predictability is key. And if you're not managing space well and you're too close to other traffic, you're too close to other road users, you're too close to other vehicles on the roadway, you are letting the other person drive for you. And this is something that you don't want to do. You want to be out of their range. Uh, if you look at boxing matches, just bear with me with this analogy here, they always tell you what the fighter's range is. Essentially, it's how far they can reach, right? That is their range. Fighter with the longer reach has the advantage because they're going to be able to get to you before you can get to them because they have a longer reach. And how I compare this to driving is, is that you have to be outside of other drivers reach. And if you're too close to that other driver, that other vehicle on the roadway, you are basically giving up your self-direction on the roadway. You're allowing other somebody else to drive your vehicle because you're hoping that you can react fast enough if that driver makes an emergency move. So if you create space around your vehicle, you're now taking back your ability to drive safely and pilot your vehicle so that nothing happens. And as well, with a lot of space around your vehicle, you're creating a space buffer that's going to allow you to look at traffic patterns around you and it's going to allow you to predict the individual actions of other road users on the roadway according to a set of rules and culture of the roadway because many drivers have said to me that nobody stops at a stop sign all people speed uh, this is part of what I call social driving and it's where other drivers you know the, the road rules are in place but they're not going to keep you safe if you follow the road rules. Traffic rules no more prevent traffic crashes than criminal law prevents crime. It's not a strong enough tool to be able to do that. So you need to understand the culture of driving, you need to understand road rules, and you need to understand how to keep yourself safe. One of the things you need to do in order of space management when you're creating space around your vehicle, you now have time to look ahead at controlled intersections and we talked about this last week in terms of intersections. 40% of crashes happen at intersections and you need to locate where the intersections are because this is where the highest uh, number of conflict points are between you and other road users. So you need to look at turning lanes, you need to look at left turning lanes, you need to understand where traffic is, are other drivers running the red light and those types of things. Uh, if you're going uh, crash on the roadway and those types of things, look for rubberneckers or anything that's out of the ordinary. And you need to be covering the brake in preparation for those hazards along the roadway that could potentially cause a crash, cause you to be injured, cause you to be killed in a car crash. Know the characteristics of the vehicles and road users that are around you on the roadway because there's six types of vehicles, almost seven now, Pedestrians, cyclists, motorcycles, people driving buses, trucks, cars, uh, trams, trolleys, and now we have scooters. The people with mobility challenges who are on electric scooters driving up and down the side of the roadway. Those are part of the road users as well now. Okay, so in the spring we're gonna have motorcycles. We're also gonna have RV units. We're gonna have you know people traveling through our town or location where we live, and they're going to be lost, and they're going to have unpredictable road behavior so you are going to have to predict all of that as being a new driver and being a safe driver on the roadways so what I said about traffic patterns is, is that by interpreting traffic patterns it's going to allow you to interpret the actions of individual road users and you do this by looking farther down the road interpreting the vehicles movements looking at the driver through the glass into the vehicle and seeing is the driver looking around is the driver driving erratically uh, do they have signals on, lights, intentions, those types of things? So pay attention to your, your driving and have patience as well. As the baby boomer generation ages uh, uh, and they're in urban areas, a lot of these older people are beginning to lose their physical abilities, they're beginning to lose their ability to drive well, and they're driving slowly. You need to have patience in that event because if you go out and you pass 
in a section of roadway where it's not safe to pass, there's you passing through an intersection or something like that, you increase exponentially the risk of you being involved in a crash. So space management. Uh, one of the key tenets of the Smith Space Cushion System, which I'm going to talk a little bit more here in another slide, is leave yourself an out. And the very key to that is uh, it's faster to drive out of an emergency situation than it is to break out of an emergency situation. But you need space around your vehicle. You need somewhere to go. If you don't have somewhere to go, it's not going to work for you. And what I tell drivers is that you can always manage the space in front of your vehicle. Do not close up that space in, the in front of the vehicle because if you're too close to the vehicle in front of you, as I said to you previously, you're now allowing that other vehicle to drive your car and hoping that your reaction time is enough. And that's going to work for you in most instances, but in some instances it's simply not going to work and you're going to either rear end the other vehicle or have some sort of crisis uh, situation or you're gonna be on and off the brakes all the time. If you find yourself on and off the brakes all the time because the vehicle in front of you uh, is braking uh, or you're too close, that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna find yourself too close and you're gonna find yourself braking all the time. So too close to other road users and fixed objects. This is something that you don't want to do if you want to be a safer driver, okay? Smith Space Cushion System. The five tenets of the Smith Space Cushion System are get the big picture, Make sure they see you, aim high in your steering, and keep your eyes moving. And then the last one, and the only one that talks about space management uh, in the five tenets of the Smith Space Cushion System are is leave yourself an out. And as I said, it's faster to steer out of an emergency situation than it is to brake, but you need an out, okay? All of these are about observation. I don't believe, I believe that you need space to be able to observe correctly and if you don't manage your space, you're not going to be able to do these other four things. Getting the big picture, making sure that other road users see you, aiming high in your steering so you can get a big picture and keep your eyes moving. Another one of the defensive driving theories is SIPTI, which is see, interpret, predict, decide, and execute. And what happened uh, was that Harold Smith died, the creator of the Smith Space Cushion System. His family took it over and they realized that they could trademark it and sell it and you can't teach it unless you pay the Smith family money. So other traffic authorities came up with SIPTI. They've come up with variations of this and nothing seems to quite work as well as the Smith Space Cushion System, but I think as <laughs> I think I have some responsibility to write down some of the defensive driving uh, posturing and theories that could help out drivers because the other thing that I like about managing space around your vehicle and managing space well is it's simple it's something easy for you to do there's a couple of simple techniques following distance of two to three seconds when you stop in traffic you stop so you can see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement when you're driving on a multi-lane road don't let vehicles drive beside you have adequate space in front of your vehicle and that way, you, you know, your space is going to close up, it's going to expand and whatnot. And you drive in the spaces between the gaggles. It's all simple and it makes you a much, much smarter driver. Okay, intersections. We talked about this briefly previously. 40% of crashes occur at intersections. If you have good space management, uh, you're going to be able to locate where the intersections are. You're going to be able to see the points of conflict and you're going to manage space well. So if you're turning left uh, at an intersection, as I said, if you stop here uh, in, on the crosswalk on the front line here, so this one here you would stop on the dot, the front steer tires on the dotted line. If you stop and wait there for traffic to clear coming from the other side and you're making a left-hand turn, you're committed to the intersection but you're not in physically in the intersection. And the reason for that is because if you're in the intersection, some driving instructors have this school of thought that you have to move out into the intersection. If you move out into the intersection and something happens, somebody runs the red light or whatnot, you're going to be involved in a crash most likely because you are now in the intersection. Whereas if you're waiting back here, this traffic comes through, there's a gap approaching, you see the gap approaching, then you can move forward and the gap approaches, you meet the gap and then you make your left hand turn and when you meet the gap, you now expedite and reduce the amount of time that you're intersect in the intersection, thus reducing your chance of being involved in a crash. So 
intersections. This is another way that you can manage space around your vehicle so you're not involved in a crash. And as well, if you're at a complex intersection making a left-hand turn with a larger vehicle, you're towing a trailer, you're in a truck or you're in a bus, uh, you can wait for the advanced green because most of these complex intersections have advanced greens. And the reason for that is to try and mitigate the uh, risk involved with uh, left-hand turns because as I talked about last week in the T-bone crash video our live stream that when you're making a left-hand turn you are risking being involved in a T-bone crash there's very little uh, automotive engineering in the vehicle that will save you and most of the time it's passengers rather that are going to be injured or killed in a T-bone crash these are often fatal in this day and age you know not so much for head-on collisions but T-bone crashes certainly they are okay so always always scan an intersection well before entering the intersection to ensure that there aren't other road users uh, in the intersection and there isn't other drivers who are running the red light on the cross street all right so good luck on your road test and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer all right so we'll transition back over here and we'll get going here so uh lots of good stuff here and if you have any questions, we'll definitely answer questions now for the remainder of the hour that we're here. Uh, Miss Louise is here, and Masika is here. Polit Feast, uh, great analogy about space management. Yes, and uh, just to, you know, you talk about boxers, we talk about fighting. Uh, just to elaborate on that point, if you are too close to other, other road users, to say that again, you are within their reach and they are going to hit you, right? It's like boxers, think of that. If you're too close to other drivers, they're physically driving your vehicle in. I was in a vehicle the other day with someone and they stop too close to traffic when they're stopped in traffic. They're too close when they're driving down the roadway and <laughs> it just, it makes me bristle when that happens because I'm at a point now in my driving career where I just keep lots of space between me and other vehicles. Because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. So don't give up your autonomy when you're driving don't let other people drive your vehicle because you're too close to them okay okay uh matthew's here from red deer uh excellent miss louise no you just missed the presentation you can definitely go back ryan is here excellent okay awesome varun can see you brilliant okay uh failed because of weak in observation so we can definitely help you with that sukitra Sukitra, we can definitely help you with your observation. Uh, Corey, I'll put the video up for you. You probably did. Uh, nope. Uh, how to observe when you're passing a road test. So basically, we'll just go over this quickly for you. Uh, four components of a road test. Passing a road test. Space management, observation, communication, and speed management. Okay, so observation. When you observe for the purposes of a road test, you're looking down, you have a scanning pattern in place. You're repeating the scanning pattern every 10 to 12 seconds. So far down the road, in, check your center mirror. Far down the road, both sides of the roadway, in, check your instrument panel because this is going to help you with speed management, checking your instrument panel. Far down the road, in, check your left wing mirror. Far down the road, both shoulders, check that mirror over there. So that's driving in a straight line and that's your scanning pattern. All right. Anytime that you're making turns, you have to shoulder check two times one approximately half a block before the turn and then immediately before making the turn. If you're sitting at the intersection for a while, you may have to shoulder check yet again a third time. All right, uh, anytime that you make a lane change, you're gonna have to sh shoulder check two times, mirror signal shoulder check. Uh, so anytime that you move the vehicle sideways, you have to shoulder check into your blind areas around your vehicle for the purposes of passing a road test. When you're reversing, 360 degree scan around the vehicle and you have to look out the back window. Most new vehicles are going to have backup cameras. You can look at the backup camera, you can check your mirrors, but for the most part you need to be looking out the back window when you're observing for the purposes of a road test. Communication, there's five ways that we communicate with other road users when we're driving. Lights and signals, horn, 
hand gestures, make sure you use all five fingers. Don't tell them they're number one on a road test. You definitely won't pass. Uh, eye contact with other road users. If you're not sure what a cyclist is doing or a pedestrian, make sure that you get eye contact and understand where they're going. And then finally, and most importantly, is the position of your vehicle on the roadway. And I tell uh, drivers this, especially when they're merging out onto a freeway. Lots of drivers have said to me in the past and have said to me that other drivers won't let them in. They're backed up and those types of things. If you're halfway down the acceleration lane and you're matching the road speed, but somebody's not moving in, you've had your signal on the whole time. That's key. <laughs> Absolutely have that signal on because if you don't ask, other drivers don't know what you're doing. They're just guessing what you're doing. So you have to ask. If you don't ask via your signal, other drivers aren't gonna help you out. But if you turn your signal on, other drivers are gonna help you out. And then if they don't help you out, they don't create a space into which you can merge on a freeway, then crowd that left side of your lane. Not out of your lane, but the left side of your lane. For those of us who drive on the right, crowd that, so that lane, and that way they're gonna get a little nervous and they're gonna create a space for you. So position of your vehicle on the roadway communicates intent uh, of your actions on the roadway. So we talked about observation, we talked about communication, and then speed management for the purposes of a road test, posted speed limit, flow of traffic, whichever is less. And for those of you driving bigger vehicles, whatever the capability of the vehicle is. So you're driving a big truck, you're going up a hill, if the big truck will only do 60 in an 80 kilometer an hour zone, uh, then that's as fast as you can go for the purposes of a road test. Now, just saying that for CDL drivers, those driving trucks and buses up hills, if you do go slower than 60 kilometers an hour and you're on a highway, activate your four-way flashers to indicate to other traffic that you are going slower. All right, uh, so that's speed management and then space management, the most important component for both passing a road test and being defensive when you're driving. Space management, two to three second following distance in a passenger vehicle. And if road conditions deteriorate, then you're going to have to increase your following distance. Stopping in traffic. Uh, stop so you can see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. Uh, stopping at intersections. You stop before the stop line, before the sidewalk or crosswalk line. If those two conditions don't exist, then you stop at the edge where the two, uh, the edge of the roadway where the two intersections meet. And oftentimes where the pavement joins or the bitumen joins, there's going to be a bit of a seam there. You're going to stop there. So uh, two to three second following distance, space management. I think that's it. Stop in traffic, stop at intersections, okay? Uh, and don't block intersections. That's the other key component for space management. Don't enter an intersection you can't clear. That is an automatic fail on a road test. If you enter an intersection, you get stuck in that intersection and the light goes to red, that's an automatic fail on a road test. And again, yellow lights this uh, for new drivers this is difficult especially on a road test because for the purposes of a road test yellow and red are the same color <laughs> you cannot enter an intersection on a yellow light for the purposes of a road test because if you are going through the intersection you entered the intersection on a yellow the driving examiner me as the driving instructor i'm looking up through the top of the windscreen and if i if you're halfway through the intersection and that light goes red automatic fail on a road test and it takes a bit of practice for you to kind of know, can I stop for the yellow light or can I not stop for the yellow light? And know that no vehicle will stop in its own length. So tractor trailer will not stop in its own length. Car will not stop in its own length. Bus will not stop in its own length. So if you're farther back than one vehicle length from the intersection, you're gonna have to come to a stop. If you're one vehicle length or closer to the intersection, then you're gonna proceed through the intersection. As If you do proceed through the intersection, scanning the intersection uh, and covering the brake and making sure that you're going through safely. And as well, in terms of proceeding through on a yellow light, if you come up and the light turns yellow, all of a sudden you, you're gonna, you might have to lock it up for the purposes of a road test. And we've had some guys in some big trucks who've done that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know the trucks making all kinds of noise and the tires are squealing and those types of things you might have to do that for the purposes of a road test okay it's not pretty but you got to get it stopped you can't enter the intersection on a yellow light all right eurasia hello my road test is on the 13th in british columbia next week awesome good luck for that uh we answer any questions we can 
I just went through everything you raises. So if you haven't, you didn't hear that sort of from the beginning in terms of speed management, space management, observation, and communication, just back the live stream up and have a look at that. All right. Uh, Jaden, my friend. Hey, Rick, I had a scrape on my knee yesterday because I fell on the sidewalk. So does that mean when it's a bruise, when it hurts, does it mean <laughs> I have to drive? Uh, yeah, just uh, put some polysporin on a Jaden and carry on with the driving. Uh, I've had a bum leg the last couple of weeks. I got a nerve or something pinched in my leg, and it's it's all good. It's all good. Okay. Olivia uh, from California. When I was merging on the freeway, I know I checked to make sure I was clear and emerging onto the acceleration lane, but a semi came very fast, and I was run off the side. All right. So, Olivia, when that happens, do not hold your course. Okay, the semis, some of these semi drivers, I don't know what it is about them, but they think that they got the right of way when they're on the freeway. They don't have to slow down, they don't have to move over, but you need to let off the throttle. And just this, just the motion, Olivia, of you letting off the throttle is going to let that truck go by you, and you can move in behind that truck because there's going to be a pretty good space behind that truck into which you can merge into. Do not let them force you off the road. And this is another thing for new drivers that I will talk about just briefly because I'm just kind of thinking about this a little bit uh, from the time that I was a new driver to now that you need to hold your course. And this goes with what Olivia was saying about merging onto a freeway. You need to hold your course as you're coming down uh, on the on-ramp and the on-ramp turns to an acceleration lane. You need to match the speed of the traffic on the highway or freeway and you need to find that space and you aim for that space, okay? Don't aim for in front of a big truck, especially a big truck that's up to speed because it's very unlikely that that big truck is gonna slow down. I would suggest for new drivers, the safe factor, the safer uh, option for you is to let off the throttle, get into the space in behind the big truck and that is going to keep you safe. Okay, but as you're coming around on the on-ramp and you see the acceleration lane, you've got your signal on, aim for that space and aim for the space behind the big truck because as I said, when they're up to speed, it's very unlikely that they're going to get over, especially if it's busy because if it's busy, they can't get over. I mean, most professional truck drivers will do what they can to move over if they see vehicles uh, trying to merge out onto the freeway, but sometimes they simply can't. And, uh, you know, I, I do say to them, you know, you got to let off the throttle a little bit and the other person will accelerate. But unfortunately, with new drivers and other drivers, for whatever reason, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Maybe some of the smart drivers can share some of their own feelings around this topic, but they don't get on the accelerator. They don't hammer down when they get onto the acceleration lane. And this is what you should be doing when you get on that acceleration lane hammer down it's the one time that you can put the metal to the pedal and get that sucker going because you need to get up to highway speed as quickly as possible to get out onto the freeway safely okay so we'll talk a little bit about that as well all right um uh what i can do so olivia what you can do is you gotta scan as you're coming out on the on-ramp on the acceleration lane you gotta be looking out on the freeway checking out the traffic you might even have to be looking out here but you need to be scanning and observing there's a I know there's a lot of things going on and especially for new drivers there's a lot of things going on and unfortunately you know maybe they didn't get the correct training they didn't have somebody who could help them or break it down for them and show them how to do it safely but you got to be looking in the mirrors you got to be looking over there looking forward pointing the vehicle accelerating I know there's a lot of stuff that's really going on at the same time there Sukitra, so uh, while well, going straight in an intersection and if there is no stop sign, is it necessary to observe and stop? No. Okay, if the intersection Sukitra isn't controlled, you don't come to a stop. You simply scan the intersection as you're approaching and then proceed through the intersection if you have the right of way. You know, some of the major roads through residential areas and those types of things are not going to be controlled intersection. The only intersection Sukitra that you have to come to a stop at are controlled intersections and controlled intersections are stop signs yield signs traffic lights those are controls on an intersection and only at those intersections do you have to come to a stop okay if those conditions don't exist you don't have to come to a stop because it's an uncontrolled intersection so basic right-of-way rules are major roads over minor roads 
straight through traffic over turning traffic and right turning traffic over left turning traffic. Those are basic road rules. Now, of course, there are going to be variations and nuances to those depending on where you are in the world. And we had one of those last week. One, uh, one of the smart drivers said to me that in the state of Michigan, you can't use left center turning lanes or sometimes called suicide lanes as either a merging lane to get out onto a busy road or to pass. And obviously, I would completely say, yes, it's illegal if you're going to use those to pass. Do not use them to pass because it's simply just too dangerous. But sometimes in busier urban areas, when you're trying to move, uh, turn left off a minor road out onto a major road, you might have to get into that left center turning lane to get up to speed and then merge out into the, the traffic. And yes, it's illegal in some places and you can't do it. But this again comes back to road rules, traffic rules. Are the traffic rules meeting up with the culture of driving? And how do you keep yourself safe on the roadway? If that's the only way you can do it, is use that left center turning lane as a merging lane, then you're gonna to have to do that. Otherwise, you're gonna be sitting there forever or you're gonna to have to back up and find another route. It's one or the other, okay? Uh, <laughs> Varun, how would it be if we only have exclusive signals guided right and left turns? No advanced signals, turn only on green. Uh, T-bone crashes would be significantly reduced. Uh, I'm trying to follow you, Varun, and what you're saying. Uh, turn only on green. Yes, if you had advanced traffic lights, but that's just not an option because unfortunately, because traffic ebbs and flows and you get busy times during the day, uh, you need advanced green turning lights. At other times of the day, you don't have advanced green turning lights and you have re much reduced traffic and then drivers have to turn whether they want to or not. So I don't know what the answer is to reduce the risk of being involved in a T-bone crash at a left turn intersection. And again, uh, drivers, depending on who the driver is, drivers have different skill sets and different abilities. You know, maybe they're distracted, uh, maybe they're high because now we have the legalization of marijuana and I know lots of people are driving, uh, you know, not only when they're intoxicated, but also when they've, you know, been smoking marijuana, uh, lots of people are, you know, they're not, they're not, they're full. All of their attention is not on the task of driving. There's so many other things going on and it only takes one moment of inattention for something to happen or you to potentially be involved in a crash. Okay. Carrie, you mentioned that you need to stay between the clusters of vehicles. How do you do that? Vehicles always seem to be passing me or I'm passing them. Okay, so Carrie, this um, just start to observe vehicles. And when you're driving down the highway, look in front of you. There's going to be a clus cluster of vehicles in front of you. And that cluster of vehicles is going to move down the roadway together. There's going to be a group of six or a dozen vehicles. And they're going to be moving down the roadway. And then you'll see behind them, probably, uh, you know, about a mile behind them, you'll see another group of vehicles, 15, 12 or 15 vehicles. You want to drive in the spaces between those clusters. Same thing when you're on the freeway. You're always going to see that. Uh, you're going to see these clusters of vehicles going down the freeway. And I don't know what it is about this herd mentality it is with drivers, but you need to drive in those spaces in between those clusters. That's what you want to do. It's essentially back to the same point about space management. You want to manage space around your vehicle. It's the same thing is if you're going down the roadway, and you're on a multi-lane roadway and there's two vehicles. There's you and there's another vehicle right here. And the, the, the two of you are kind of tracking down the road. You should feel very uncomfortable when that happens. I feel very uncomfortable. There wasn't a time, <laughs> there was a time that I tried to make that happen. But now that knowing what I know about traffic crashes and road safety, uh, I feel very uncomfortable with that. And when that happens, I get another vehicle behind me or beside me. I just back off and let them go because I don't want that vehicle there because I want that space in case something happens. I mean, the other thing that you need to understand about me as a driver too, that when I'm not teaching you drivers, you know, how to pass a road test and staying at the speed limit, I like speed. <laughs> I drive with the traffic flow. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, I'm doing a little bit faster than what the speed limit is but I leave myself an out. I always leave myself an out and I always manage space around my vehicle. If the traffic's not going at the traffic flow or it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing on the weekend, for example, I drove up to Kamloops, I just hang back. 
until I get to a passing lane because I was driving on 97B between Vernon here and Kamloops and it's a two lane road for the most part, but there's a number of passing lanes along the way. I just hang back when other drivers are insisting that they're gonna drive at the speed limit or below the speed limit, hang back until I get to a passing lane and then I pass them and I carry on with my life. Okay, uh, Mohammed. Thanks for another wonderful video. Please, is there a best time uh, within the day for G test? Uh, yeah, depending on Mohammed, what I would suggest to you in terms of doing a G test for you there in Ontario, whatever is your best time of the day. If you're a morning person, you get up and you're really good to go in the morning, then do your test in the morning. If you're more of an afternoon person, then get up and do your test in the afternoon. I would suggest to you not to try and do your road test during rush hour. If you if you live in a large urban center, uh, try not to do it sort of you know seven to nine in the morning. Don't do it sort of three to five in the afternoon. Try and do it at ten or eleven o'clock in the morning. The other thing that I would suggest, Mohammed, is when you do book your road test and you have your road test time, go and practice in and around the test center at the time when your road test is. So if it's on Tuesday at ten o'clock then go out during the week weekday rather, and practice your road test at 10 o'clock uh, in and around the test center where you're going to be taking your test. The other thing I would recommend, Mohammed, is to book a practice driving test with a local driving school if you haven't taken driving lessons, okay? That way they can take you out, uh, get you practicing on the test routes, and they can give you feedback on your skills and abilities and any skills or abilities that might need to be strengthened for the purposes of a road test. So that's what I would recommend to you uh, for going for your G-test there in Ontario. Okay, Ronnie, thank you for the valuable information. You're most welcome. Big money boss. Oh my God, it's so, so sad I can't watch right now, but I came to say hi. I uh, can't wait to see the video later. Big money boss, so glad for dropping in. Uh, Big Money Boss is one of the early smart drivers here, and if you've seen some of the videos, the speed management video, for example, uh, Big Money Boss asked a lot of questions, and I was doing a lot of videos uh, that was mentioning Big Money Boss because he was asking me questions about things that I wasn't even thinking about because uh, it's it's some of the videos that I've created have been great videos because of smart drivers asking me questions. And when you ask me questions and I go out and make a video about it or I think about it, I think, oh yeah, I never thought about that before. So that's how the videos get made is feedback from you, the smart drivers, which makes all of this better and better able to help uh, you become a smarter driver, uh, have better defensive posturing and earn your, your license. So that's how we do that. Okay, excellent Varun, glad we were able to help out. Katie is here, thanks so much Katie. Never too late, <laughs> you're here and that's awesome. Uh, I feel sometimes when I am near other vehicles on the freeway, I feel like I'm racing for some reason. Yeah, and that's, that's really great Katie, because you should be racing, because you're on the freeway and you're going like a crazy person. <laughs> so to speak, in a matter of speaking, right? Uh, yeah, when you first get on the freeway, that's definitely what it feels like, especially when you're doing 60, 70 miles an hour on the freeway. Uh, you are really going. So, yeah, it feels a little bit like you're racing, indeed. Especially when you're passing the slower vehicles on the freeway or the interstate. Yeah, you're really moving along there. Uh, Carrie is looking far down the road for hazards part of space management, too. Yes, it definitely is, uh, Carrie, because, uh, you know, Space management and observation dovetail. They go together like this, right? You can't have one without the other. And if you're looking far down the road, you're looking at the traffic patterns far down the road and you're interpreting what other drivers are going to be doing. And that's what you're trying to do. That is the key to defensive driving, to managing space around your vehicle. So for example, using the my trip up to Kamloops on the weekend, you're on a two lane road, you got the big cluster of vehicles because inevitably you get that slowest driver is always in the front because the vehicles back up behind that car. So you got to back off and just watch the cluster of vehicles stay behind the cluster of vehicles because when they're going down a two lane road up and down like this, inevitably you got six cars in a line and they're all like sandwiched together because those, as I said, the slowest person is in the front and all those other vehicles are just looking and inching for a place to be able to pass that vehicle in front so they can get going because everybody's wants to get up to road speed because 
even though it's 90 kilometers an hour, which is 55 miles an hour along that section of roadway between here, between Vernon and uh, Kamloops, British Columbia, the traffic flow along there is 110 kilometers an hour. It's 30 kilometers an hour above what the posted speed limit is. And it's going to vary a little bit depending on where you are in the world, where you are in the United States, where you are in Canada, Europe, Australia, about how much difference there is with traffic flow and what measures are in place that are going to mitigate that traffic flow. For example, in Australia, they have speed cameras. And because they have speed cameras, the speed limit's 100 kilometers an hour, everybody's doing 100 kilometers an hour because nobody wants to get a ticket. Whereas here in British Columbia, we have very few police because it's we have a low population density, therefore we don't have very many police. And because we don't have very many police, the traffic flow tends to be higher. Whereas if you go to Ontario, the traffic flow tends to be less. It only tends to be about 10 kilometers an hour above the posted speed limit because it's high population density and you have many more police. <laughs> When I went home in the summertime to Ontario, I, I, I think I saw more police in the first two days than I had in three months in British Columbia because we have a low population density. Therefore, we don't have as many police in British Columbia. Okay? So all of those control what the traffic flow is and how fast the traffic is traveling along certain different roadways and those types of things. All right. Uh, Polyfest, how do you get between the clusters? Uh, do you go to the right lane and wait for your chance? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think Polyfe Polyfeast, uh, you're misinterpreting me. And this is basically what I'm talking about with the clusters of vehicles is that when you're on highways or freeways, you're going to have a cluster of vehicles here. So you're going to have 10 or 15 vehicles here in a cluster moving down the freeway. They're really close together. Here, you're going to have a cluster. And then back here, you're going to have a cluster. And you're going to have about a mile, half a mile in between them. You want to be in the spaces between these clusters of vehicles as you're going down the freeway. And basically, I'm, I'm going to try and do a video for you on this so that I can uh, talk to you about and show you how to do this to drive in the, in the spaces between the clusters on highways and freeways and whatnot. Okay, so we'll do that and we'll help you out. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see. Varun, uh, is it okay to pass low-moving scooters that are driving closer to the curb rather than being in the center of the lane? Excellent question, Varun. Uh, what you need to, yes, you do need to pass scooters, obviously, and you're going to have to move over to the other lane of traffic. Corey will get the video up for you. You need to do the whole procedure of changing lanes. So if you've got a scooter and they're in your path of travel and you can't get around them without moving into the other lane of traffic, you need to do the whole thing. Signal, mirror signal, shoulder check, shoulder check again, move out around them, and then mirror signal, shoulder check back into your lane of travel. Okay, and this that happens with any obstruction on the roadway. Uh, if you need to change lanes, you've got to do the whole procedure if you're going for a road test to be safe. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Kamal, uh, do I have to turn to the right lane after turning from an intersection to the left? Yes. When you make a left-hand turn on a road test and you're turning from a multi-lane road onto another multi-lane road, you immediately have to move over to the right-hand lane. Even without the driving examiner telling you that. Unless the driving examiner says to you, okay, at the next block, I want you to turn left again then you would stay in the left-hand lane. But for the most part, when you make a left-hand turn, you simply move right back over to the right-hand lane as soon as you do that, okay? All right, uncapable with trucks becoming more and more common as a first vehicle daily of choice, uh, consider going back to your parallel parking series and adjusting the lessons for longer, wider vehicles. Uh, yes, uncapable. Some of those need to be done uh, with bigger vehicles because a lot of people are driving bigger vehicles, as you said. However, <laughs> I do encourage you to think seriously about what kind of vehicle you're going to take for your road test because uh, it's just it's going to be easier for you if you're driving a mid-sized vehicle. Uh, a Toyota Corolla or a Honda uh, Civic, those are the types of vehicles that are going to be expected to show up on a road test. If you show up in your big Dodge 1500, it's going to be a bit tougher for you to be able to do those uh, through those videos. But... I have access to a Dodge 1500. 
I even have access to a 2500 so maybe I'll do it in the 2500 but that's a good point this is that I could do some big some videos with some bigger vi vehicles uh, and uh, help you out with that as well and the other thing that I could do uh, what was I just thinking something through my head yes Corey put the video up for you on driving SUVs and how to drive an SUV and be safe in those as well okay Thanks. Can't wait. Kimel, uh, do I have to turn? Yes, we already talked about that. Carrie, what is the most important thing to look for when trying to predict traffic patterns? All right. So the, the most important thing that you're looking for with traffic patterns is you're looking for unpredictable actions. So for example, you come up to a complex intersection, somebody enters the left turning lane, and then all of a sudden what they're trying to do is, is that they realize that they're going the wrong way and now they're trying to get back out of the turning lane into the mainstream of traffic. That's an unpredictable action. Or somebody makes a right hand turn, uh, not at the slip lane, but they go up to the corner and then make a right hand turn. That's an unpredictable action. Or pedestrians at intersections are jaywalking they're not crossing at the intersection or crossing at the crosswalk line those are unpredictable actions and that's what you're looking for at the intersection because when drivers execute unpredictable actions that's when you risk a conflict that's when you risk being involved in a traffic crash so anytime that the traffic patterns are not doing what they should be doing according to the construct of the roadway the road engineering then that's when you're going to get into trouble. For example, I've seen cyclists here. <laughs> we have a number of cyclists and we have a road culture in British Columbia where cyclists ride into traffic. So you'll be going down the roadway and there's a bicycle lane running along the side of the roadway and bicycles will be riding towards you. <laughs> For me as a cyclist who has cycled all over the world, when cyclists are cycling in the bike lane towards traffic, that just like my my radar just goes <laughs> does not compute does not compute why would you do that i mean maybe some of the smart drivers out there <laughs> could get me, could fill me in on why that is or how that culture developed but riding a bicycle into traffic along a bike lane is just like tad amount to being hurt because the other thing about it is 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 there's less damage there's less injury when two vehicles are moving in the same direction this is why freeways have less accidents and less crashes i can't believe i just said accidents but less crashes on that are less severe because when vehicles collide that are moving in the same direction it's less severe okay especially at lower speeds in a city so if you have a bicycle that's moving along at say i don't know 50 miles an hour and you got a car coming along and they're riding 30 and they they collide you know hopefully the the bicycle just the the rider just bounces off the bicycle onto the sidewalk or whatnot but if if you got a a bicycle 15 miles an hour coming this way and a, and a car going this way at 30 now it's 45 miles an hour if the bicycle runs into the car the cyclist is probably going to die so it just it it does i don't get it <laughs> i don't get it uncapable uh you're most welcome uh <laughs> oh one if you're psychic uh, you can be even a better driver well you can be psychic there is you know traffic patterns are fairly predictable and it's fairly easy to understand other people's uh, actions on the roadway uh, because you kind of have to understand that it's kind of me first right I want to go where I want to go and I'm gonna get there but if you look at traffic patterns and you observe well down the roadway you can see when other people are being goofy you can see when cyclists are just kind of riding willy-nilly all over the roadway or you can see that uh, pedestrians are going to jaywalk on the roadway or whatnot. So it's you can be psychic when you're driving. You can watch other traffic. You can pay attention to what's going on. And if you manage space around your vehicle, coming back to what I was talking about in Defensive Driving 101, manage space, manage the space in front of your vehicle, then yes, indeed, you can be a psychic driver. Because remember, the good driver, the defensive driver, the smart driver is the one that has a road trip from point A to point B that is like oh, boring. If your road trip is boring, then you are at a very high level of driving because if it's boring, nothing happened, 
That's exactly what you want. You don't want excitement. You don't want to be on the brakes all the time. You don't want to be jostling your passengers around in your vehicle. Because if you're doing all of that, then you're not driving well. You're not being proactive. You're not being a predictable driver. You're, you need to improve your skills. If you can make your drive boring, then you're doing the right thing when you're driving. Okay? Carrie, uh, what is the best way to scan for jaywalking pedestrians at times have been afraid that they may not look and just walk out in front of my car? And that does happen, Carrie, uh, that they do just walk out in front of your vehicle, but you need to be prepared for that. If you're looking down the roadway and you see pedestrians, if they're, you know, if they're walking along the footpath or the sidewalk, then they're probably going to be okay. But if you have a crosswalk or you have an intersection, then you need to be wary of what pedestrians are doing. If they're not in the center of the sidewalk, if they're out near the edge of the roadway, then be wary of where what they're doing. Again, positioning of the pedestrian. Where is the pedestrian physically on the sidewalk? Are they near the edge of the road? Are they in the center of the sidewalk? If they're in the center of the sidewalk, it's unlikely that they're going to step out into the roadway. But if they're right near the edge of the roadway, if you, you know, have pedestrians who, you know, look disheveled and whatnot <laughs> they had a night of drinking or they you know they're the undesirables of our society uh then there's a good chance that they could just walk out into the roadway but again keep in mind physical proximity to the road where is that pedestrian in relation to the roadway same thing with cars on the roadway where where is it where is the vehicle physically on the roadway that will give you clues to the actions of the driver or the road user Okay. Uh, Western Movies. Hey, Smart Drive Test. I bought a Ford F-150 four-wheel drive. I passed my driver's test by watching your videos. Excellent Western Movies. That is simply awesome. And we were just talking about that, about taking road tests in bigger vehicles. Uh, so you got a Ford F-150, so that's a half-ton pickup truck, the Ford model. And we were just, I was just talking, one of the Smart Drivers asked me about making a video using some of the bigger vehicles. Uh, to parallel park and drive and those types of things because a lot of drivers now are using pickup trucks and bigger vehicles and whatnot so we can definitely help you out with that all right poly feast uh can you explain the way you teach parallel parking i don't understand when you talk about looking at the house across the street okay so poly feast what you're looking for is you pull up beside the other vehicle you're approximately three feet from the vehicle so you could basically have another person standing between your vehicle and that vehicle on the side of the road you want to line up the bumpers so you look out the back kind of window there and you can see the rear of that vehicle so you stop put your vehicle into reverse to activate your reverse lights you've already got your signal on because you put your signal on as you were approaching and then when you stop you pause you look for the 45 degree angle that's what you're talking about about the house across the roadway you're looking for a landmark that's approximately 45 degrees and 45 degrees for most vehicles, the post, which is what holds the front windshield in, the edge of the front windshield, just behind that post is going to be your 45 degree mark. So you're gonna turn your wheel all the way to the right. You're gonna back up until you're facing that 45 degree mark. That's what the purpose of the 45 degree is mark. When you're facing that 45 degree mark, then you straighten your wheels out and you come back so the back of the vehicle that you're parking behind is one third to one half down the hood, depending on how far that vehicle, how big that vehicle is or how far it is from the, from the curb. And then, so you back up straight and then you turn your wheel all the way to the left and you come in and you stop when you're in line with the vehicle in front of you, you put it in drive, pull forward just a little bit so that you can just see the top of the bumper of the vehicle in front of you. When you can see that, then you put your vehicle into park, apply the parking brake, release the foot brake, and then save the exam, okay, I'm done. I've finished my parallel parking. So that's how you do it. And that's the purpose of what you're looking for, what you're being confused about is the 45 degree mark. And as well, Corey will find the video for you on, not the video, but the link to the parallel parking over at the Smart Drive Test website. And there's an image there that will show you how to find the 45 degree angle uh, that you're looking for when you're setting up for your parallel park. Okay, so Western Movie, so you had a 2010 F-150, excellent, and you did your road test, and that is tremendous, awesome achievement. I, where did you go for your first uh, celebration out for your first solo drive in your pickup truck there? Did you go out with your significant other? Okay, Epic, watching your videos, Rick. 
on car and commercial vehicles and speaking of defensive driving during the nighttime, you need to look at oncoming traffic headlights and at junctions to avoid two bone crashes. Yes, uh, one of the things that I've discovered and this is the point that Epic is making is, is that at nighttime, a lot of drivers have difficulty finding the roadway and I realized this a few years ago when I was taking truck and bus drivers out at night uh, that they have trouble locating the roadway. So you need to follow other traffic. Other traffic will indicate where the roadway is because for the most part other traffic is going to drive on the roadway and as well when you see the line of traffic coming from the other direction you can look far down the road and you can see where the roadway is by that line of traffic coming towards you so that's what we're talking about there andrew is in alberta edmonton it's ice and snow in a blizzard <laughs> in edmonton uh excellent andrew i passed my road test yesterday thanks to your videos congratulations that's awesome and passing in the winter time and we do have winter coming up, and I'll just put this note in there with what Andrew just said on passing his road test in the winter time. It's easier to pass your road test in the winter time with because it doesn't have to be as exact. All right, you don't have to stop at before the stop line or before the sidewalk line in at intersections because they're snow covered. You can't see them. You don't have to be eight to twelve inches be away from the curb. You just have to be behind the vehicle in front of you when you're parking. Uh, because there's a big snowbank there and you don't want to get into the snowbank because I'll tell you right now, driving examiners won't push your car out. <laughs> if you get stuck on a road test, I'm sorry, but that's an automatic fail. The examiner's just going to get out of your car and they're just going to walk back to the test center. <laughs> so don't get stuck. Don't drive into a snowbank in the wintertime. So it's easier. It's a little bit easier in the wintertime. Yes, there's some other challenges with driving in the wintertime, but I strongly encourage you as a smart driver to consider taking your road test in the winter time because it's a little bit easier and you're going to be successful doing that just like Andrew was okay um, excellent uh, urge 101 uh, it's more about experience than knowing rules and yes and this comes back to what I was saying before about driving is experiential the more experience you have driving the easier it is going to be for you to be able to drive well and pass a road test and practice, practice, practice. Driving is not a spectator sport. It's not something you can watch my videos and learn how to drive, learn how to pass a road test. You have to get in a vehicle and you have to drive it. So that's what you need to do, okay? So there, Corey puts, uh, put the link up for you for the image to find the 45 degree over at the Smart Drive Test. Have a look at that. Uh, Katie, you get nervous driving at night. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen the video on night driving, Katie, but definitely have a look at that. That'll give you some skills and abilities to be able to drive better at night. Okay, epic. Uh, there we go. Excellent. Andrew, I got a perfect score, but I definitely more leniency, but the 45 degree angle and the power parking really helped. Excellent. Glad we could help out with all of that. That is really great. All right, so if you are going for a road test, make sure you head over to the Smart Drive Test website and get the driver's license checklist. That will definitely help you out with passing your road test. And as well, uh, hit that thumbs up button, uh, give it a like, share the video around if you like what you see here and the information that you're getting. Definitely help us out. And again, if you like what you see, definitely consider subscribing to Smart Drive Test. Uh, <laughs> Carrie, looking forward to the video on driving between the clusters. And yes, we can definitely help you with, uh, out with that and make you a better defensive driver. Alla, I failed my G exam because I was too close to the car on my right behind me when changing lanes to the right. How to know when I move to the right. All right, so Alla, one of the things you want to do is have a look at the video on changing lanes. That will definitely help you out. Uh, four vehicles that are behind you and you're going to move in front of that vehicle in order to lane change you should really the vehicle in the mirror should be in the top one-third of the mirror if it's not in the top one-third of the mirror then you can't move over and again it comes back to proper communication for lane changes you have to have a minimum of three flashes on the signal to indicate to other traffic that you are going to move over wish to move over because if you do that oftentimes they're going to let off the throttle and they're going to create a bigger space for you which is going to allow you to move into that space but Corey will put the video up for you on changing lanes and definitely have a look at that and that'll help you out to be successful on that and if you have any more questions about 
passing your G test, anything we can help you out with, then definitely do that. Uh, but you know, it's kind of a bummer. I know it's a bummer. It's not fun to not be successful on your road test, but definitely have a look at that and that'll help you out. Okay, Michael, uh, semi-truck driver. I have a 17 year old trying to get a license. We have a Mini Cooper, but kid has a hard time with manual. I have a Yukon XL, very big. Kid is uh, has issues with parallel parking. Any suggestions? Uh, yes, Michael, definitely have a look at the video on parallel parking. That'll help you out to get started. Now you have a Yukon. Yeah, they're big. They're big vehicles for sure. Hmm. And the Mini Cooper is a manual. Yeah, and definitely if you're in the States there, I'm not going to recommend that you go and take a uh, road test with a manual transmission. Uh, my suggestion would be, uh, Michael, have a look. Let them use the Yukon. Go down to the parking lot. Get some of those 36-inch, 1-meter tall pylons and let them work with those. Look at the video in the Learn to Drive playlist and do the exercises in there. The very first lesson, it's basically just driving forward, driving back, uh, do some exercises with the pylons and that'll teach him uh, where the vehicle is in space and place and really help him out uh, to be able to get used to the vehicle and drive around. But definitely, you know, let him use the Yukon because it's just, it's too hard uh, for, for students to be learning how to drive a manual transmission and trying to take a road test with a manual. I know it's a lot easier with the Mini Cooper because it's a lot smaller in those types of things, but my recommendation would be the, the Yukon. All right, there we go. Awesome. So lots of great stuff going on today. Lots of great questions. Uh, information on smart drive test are on defensive driving and dri the fundamentals of defensive driving, which is space management, manage space around your vehicle, keep a good buffer of space in front of your vehicle. And I'd like to thank Corey and I'd like to thank Colin for all their work and moderating. Really awesome uh, to have them here and make this all work seamlessly. <laughs> so if you've got a road test coming up the next couple of weeks, good luck on that. And if you passed a road test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now.